Hey, look at us. We're on a boat. We are in York. We're doing a city centre tour. This is part two of our little um, uh, exploration of uh, York City Centre Museums and all sorts of stuff. I've uh, been here before, done a few little bits, but uh, this is the second bit of uh, our tour and uh, taking a little look around behind us. Look. Yeah, look at that. We are going to be smashing it on this supersonic speedboat of five knots. Adventures with Jay. Hi. Hiya. This is nice. Thank you. What name are you, Bakanda, please? There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome aboard. Thank, Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers. Cheers. We are abroad. Welcome aboard, darling. Oh, it's got heating in here. No, it'd be cold. Sunshine on a rainy day. Let's just have a little look around. Toilet. There's the back deck. Yep, let's do the upstairs. Let's crack off upstairs. Up the stairs. Uh, anywhere really, but there's not going to be many people, but I suppose I don't really want to get people in the film yeah, So let's go and have a little look at the captain's uh, look. Uh, No, we'll sit near the back somewhere. Yeah Let's have a look at the little captain's thingy look There's his little wheel And the throttles Safety boat, lifeboat, whatever. Oh, and look who's there. All right. All right, John. <laughs> hey, key. All right. This is it folks, this is it, we are moving. Let's take a look. What's happening down here? Oh, it's got a bow thruster. Oh, good afternoon, folks, and welcome aboard the River Palace for this one hour early evening cruise. As we leave our landing here, I need to go through a brief safety announcement to let you know of the life saving equipment on board. As you probably expect, the River Palace has more than enough life saving equipment for all 75 of us. It takes the form of the open reversible inflatable life raft in a white canister at the left of my wheelhouse. At the back of the top deck, there's a stack of orange rigid buoyant apparatus and there's life rings around the vessel, which are all designed to be launched manually. But of course, both the life rings and the buoyant apparatus will float free if required. In the saloon, we have firefighting equipment in the form of fire extinguishers at the front and back of the saloon, as well as a small extinguisher in the wheelhouse with me. There's also a first aid kit downstairs behind the bar for minor injuries, though we do try to avoid using it, so do be careful as you move around the vessel, especially near the stairs and exits. And should you find yourself downstairs in the saloon during the trip, you should notice that in addition to the exits in the front and rear, there are large windows throughout the saloon that can be opened to form additional exits if required. Of course, in the very unlikely event of an emergency, we ask you all to remain calm, listen to instructions given to you by myself or the crew, and if asked to evacuate the vessel, then please do so in a calm, orderly manner by your nearest and safest exit. I'll also let you know it is a non smoking cruise, so whether you smoke or vape, well, please don't. For the next hour or so. And lastly, a few introductions. My name's Chris. 
I'll be diving the boat today. I'll give my very best to keep it on the wet bit, avoid the bridges, while pointing out the sights and stories along the river. I'll also be throwing a few terrible jokes into the mix for good measure, so you have been warned. Now it's there this evening, doing all the really hard work, tying the ropes, selling the tickets and serving the shopping bar, I'm very ably assisted by Louise. Well, now we have all that out of the way, I'll begin the commentary. And the first thing I'd like to talk about is just through the bridge here on the right hand side. If you pass through the bridge, if you look ahead of us on the right there, you'll see there's a balcony that runs behind the Yorkshire Herald building. Well, the Yorkshire Herald building used to be the old printing press of the city. That's where at one time the local paper, the Yorkshire Press, was printed. Until about 15 years ago, when that was moved to Harrogate. Nowadays, that Yorkshire Herald building is a very nice three screen cinema and bar. And as you can see as you pass, there are other bars and cafes alongside that balcony. And because of that, well, we do see some unusual sights along there. To be honest with you, ladies and gentlemen, on most evenings, it's yeah, not there a lot. I've been drunk in there. One, see there a lot, yeah. Along this yeah. balcony. Yeah. Although, got I hammered in there one night. night. <laughs> but then it wasn't really the balcony I wanted to talk about. It's actually what lies beneath. So as we go along here, if you look down far right from the side, you'll see there's some doorways that it's not all. And they are actually alleyways that went up from the river to Coney Street behind, as this used to be part of the old port district of York. It was once known as St. Peter's Wharf. Those wooden jetties all the way along here, with boats laden with cargo to be taken out oh, to yeah, the that's there, that's right there. Unfortunately, though, these alleyways have now been blocked up, and to prevent the water rising up and taking over the city during some of the higher floods. But it is said there are still hundreds of these streets that run beneath the medieval city of York. In fact, if you look at Lemba Bridge directly ahead of us there, right hand side you'll see there's a tower with a flag on top it's known as lentil tower i've been told you can get from there all the way to the very top of pickle gate on the other side of town without ever seeing daylight it's just a case of passing through those underground passageways well it's my hopes that perhaps one day those passageways may be opened up once again as i think it would be very interesting to do a tour of the medieval city of york from beneath its ancient streets well, we'll talk a bit more about the bridge on the way back down river, though it's worth noting that before the bridge was here, this was also the site of the ferryman. The last ferryman was a man by the name of John Lehman. He was very popular. His own record showed that in one year, he ferried nearly 300,000 people across the river at this point. Though once the bridge was built, he was out of a job. But because he was so popular, the city decided to do a whip around. They got a pension of £15, plus a horse and cart. Although he quickly sold that horse and cart for £25, so that gave him a full pension of £40. It's not too bad, really. It's probably more than I can expect. Well, during our trip this evening, we're going to head into six bridges in total. The first one I'd like to talk about in detail is now directly ahead of us. It's Scarborough Rail Bridge. Built in 1845 as part of the East Coast Main Line, it went to the holiday destinations of Whitby, Rivington, Filey, and of course, as the name suggests, the sunny seaside town of Scarborough was once the first seaside town in the country to connect it to the United States on a rail. But we'll see if it's a bit of an unusual bridge, instead of using the rail bridge. I mean, nowadays they try and keep rolling stuff away from pedestrians, but this is obviously an exception. Although if you're walking across the footpath as a train rattles across the tracks, it can still be quite a daunting experience, because the wheels are just a few feet from the top of your head. Unsurprisingly though, it's nice on there, an improvement like. on the original design, because when the bridge was first built here, they actually had that footpath <laughs> between the two lines of rail. Well, it would seem that even the Victorian Health and Safety Authorities thought this might be a bit of an issue, so they did eventually redesign the bridge. In fact, they lowered that footpath by about four feet before placing it on the outside. Yeah. Of course, over the years, it's only got further construction. In fact, most of what we see is fairly new. The only remaining bits from the original bridge are the pillars that hold it up. Now as we pass underneath in a moment, if you look at those pillars, you'll see there's some metal boxes on them. Originally these were to hold wooden slats, which held up the main span of the bridge. Although over time these began to fall apart. And as a solution, the council just tied nets underneath the bridge to catch the debris. Well, after a few complaints from some voters who didn't want to be hit on the head with that debris, they eventually removed the slats and the nets. Although the metal boxes are still there, nowadays they make very nice nesting boxes for pigeons. The bridge was originally designed and built by Robert Stevenson, the son of George Stevenson, the man behind the Stevenson's rocket, as well as the first ever passenger carrying train in the world. Obviously quite the pedigree to live up to, which probably explains why his son decided to go into building bridges rather than trains themselves. Although considering his work, he stood here over 170 years, I think he probably made the right decision. 
Well, just a moment once we pass over the bridge here, we're actually going to keep on the theme of the railways. So once we get to the side, you can look over the trees to our left to see there's a white roof. It's the roof of the National Railway Museum, the large museum of its kind in the world. It was first opened in Europe on the 27th of September 1975, a date specifically chosen to mark the 150th anniversary of the opening of the Darlington to Stockton Line, a date considered by many to be the beginning of the railway age. Now, being that it is such a large museum, of course it hosts a variety of exhibits, there's around 1,200 at any one time. If you were to visit today, you'd be able to see the only Shinkansen bullet train outside of Japan, as well as Sir Nigel Gresley's world-famous Mallard, which is the fastest steam train ever recorded, and in my opinion, <laughs> the fastest thing ever to be named after a duck. Now, if we have any Harry Potter fans on this evening, you may be interested to know we've also had a visit to this museum from the magical Hogwarts Express. And that could be because the sign for platform nine and three quarters from the Harry Potter movies is actually in the museum. Although the sign was originally at York train station between platforms four and five, where the scenes for the film were originally shot. Of course, as you may expect, they did have a few instances with Harry Potter fans running into the wall, trying to make it to the wizarding world. I use the word fans because I don't just mean children, but adults as well. I'm sure if you've ever met a Harry Potter fan, you'd know that to be entirely true. Although after a few of those bumps and bruises, they then decide to move that sign to an archway. And that's actually now where it's situated in the museum ahead of our left. I also mentioned it is a national museum. Of course, that means it's free to enter. There's no admission charge whatsoever. And you can easily spend four or five hours or yeah, I... many exhibits. So Piss off. Scuffy cat. Spit, yeah. So we're on the next side, we're going to move ahead to our right. Just ahead of us on the right, you'll see there's a grass and bank. And as we follow that around the corner... Disgusting by our teenagers. Over the fields, you'll eventually see a dark church spire. In front of that is an old red brick building. It's the main building of St. Peter's School, which claims to be the oldest school in the country, if not the entire world. And originally it was founded in the year 627 AD, though at the time it wasn't another site, slightly closer to the Christian Minster. Well, St. Peter's is a public school. Of course, in many ways, that means it's private. It's only public to those who can afford it. Though if you are to stay there, the fees for boarders have climbed to a quite significant £30,000 per year. And that doesn't even include pocket Now, if you are lucky enough to attend the school and luckier still to become one of the head boys or head girls, there are a few benefits you receive. You're able to raise a goat or a sheep on the playing fields of St. Peter's. And should you wish to do yeah, so, you can nice. even smoke a pipe or grow a beard. Although I doubt many of the head girls have done the latter. And of course, being such an old school, there are a few famous people that have attended over its years. One of note is John Barry. Mr. Barry was a famous composer, perhaps most famous for composing the iconic James Bond theme tune. Although he actually wrote music for 11 James Bond films in total, as well as movies such as Out of Africa and Dances with Wolves. Well, the most famous tune actually came sometime before Mr. Barry, but this one you might want to refer to as infamous more than famous. At one point in his life, this man was known as John Johnson, although towards the end of his life, he was known by a few at least as Guido Johnson. But it was said that when he attended St. Peter's, he did show aptitude in subjects such as chemistry, politics, and religious education. But then it was also said he was the only man to ever enter the House of Parliament with honest intentions. As you probably expect, that turned out to be a great error on his his part. As because of that, well, he was executed and then drawn and quartered, and his remains were carried to the four corners of the empire before being placed on spikes as a warning to anyone else that may consider following suit. Although I think you'll agree, taking the current state of politics, that no one ever did. But you may have already guessed, but I am of course talking about Guy Fawkes, one of the men behind the infamous gunpowder plot of 1605. Fawkes was a York man, born and bred, and he attended St. Peter's when it was on the previous site. Actually, the land that St. Peter's today stands on, which is just coming to view ahead on our right there, once belonged to Guy's own father, and was actually sold to the school by Guy himself, just after his father's death. Of course, St. Peter's, like many schools in the country, do hold a bonfire to celebrate the fouling of the gunpowder pot on the 5th of November. With all the trimmings you would expect, they of course have fireworks, sparklers and toffee apples. But one thing they'll never do, and in fact never have done, is burn an effigy or model of guidebooks on top of their bonfire. The reason being, the 
word with your previous headmaster. It would be a real host of bad taste to birth one of the school's old boys. But it does always make me wonder what they actually teach them at the school. As you now pass St. Peter's, that you can see over there on our right and travel upstream, it's a good time for me to talk about the river we're travelling on. This is the River Ouse, spelled O U S E. So it is known as the Yorkshire Ouse, as it's one of five rivers in the country to take that name. And the word Ouse originates from a Saxon word, Ouse, which simply translates as clear, flowing water. Although, if you are looking at the river today, I think you'll agree it is water and it is flowing. But I'm not entirely sure where they got the word clear from. Now, despite the discoloration, it's actually quite a clean river. The discoloration comes from peat sediments washed down from the hills and dales, which contains a chemical known as tanning. It actually tans the water this colour, in the same way a tea bag tans a cup of tea. And if you have enjoyed a tea, coffee, or even a glass of water in the city today, you'd be interested to know that to this day, the water still comes from use, though unlike in the Victorian era, when it was originally pumped around the city in hollowed out locks without any treatment whatsoever, well, nowadays, you'd hope it undergoes some sort of cleaning process before it reaches your taps. Although it has been said about the river here that if you were to take a pint glass full of river water and then leave it out on the bank for about an hour or so, it would eventually run clear as that sediment would settle to the bottom. And at that time, some people will say you can drink the crystal clear water. Well, actually, ladies and gentlemen, you could. Although you would probably die but you could drink it, if you really wanted to. So I mentioned it is quite a clean river, and as a result we do get a lot of bird and wildfowl that live along these banks, including coots, grebes, moorhens and ducks. You might even be lucky enough to see a heron or even a kingfisher during the trip today, as often spotted up this side of town. Of course, the kingfishers are notoriously hard to spot, being that they're so small and move so quickly. Although if you do see a flash of colour, perhaps hear a shrill shriek, it's certainly worth looking in that direction, because you might just spot one. If I do one, see one sat on a branch anywhere, I'll do my very best to point it out to you. Having joined the King's State, you may have noticed the there's also quite a few geese that live on the river. There are actually two types of geese that live on the ooze. There are the Canadian geese, they're the darker of the two with the black bills and black feet. And obviously, as the name suggests, they originally emigrated from Canada. Although the more prevalent of the two types are actually the Greylack geese. They're the lighter of the two with the orange bills and orange feet. And the Greylacks originally emigrated from the Arctic. And it's said that in the Arctic, their only predator was the polar bear. Well, I will say, ladies and gentlemen, I'm yet to see a polar bear on the ooze. Although if I see one this evening, you'll be the first to know. Just listen out for a loud scream coming from the wheelhouse as I quickly turn the boat around. Although I am a professional, so I will endeavour to point it out before we escape. So now it's continuing definitely in this direction without ever turning. In about another 27 miles, we'd reach the historic cathedral city of Ripon, which used to be the northernmost point of the inland navigation. Well, to this day, you can still travel from Ripon all the way down to London, should you wish to do so, without ever going out to sea. Now, you probably need a slightly smaller and nippier boat than this one, as well as somebody to work the 90 or so locks along the way. But with those few things, you could make it to London. Although I am told that a good time from here to London is about three weeks which is a little ambitious for a one-hour cruise. So once we pass around this corner ahead of us, and under the bridge there, I'll attempt to make our first turn before I head back through the city and point out some further sights. So speaking of the bridge, it's about to come into view around this corner here. This one is Clifton Road Bridge. Well, originally this was planned as part of a trunk route around the city, but that was until the onset of World War II, but those plans were scrapped. Now, as you're about to see, by the time they got around to building this bridge, well, it was a much less ambitious project. The bridge was completed in the 1960s. It is an ex excellent example of 60s architecture, being that it's all concrete and metal. And I must admit, it's not the best looking bridge we have over the river. But it is good for at least one thing. So as we get a little bit closer, if you look at the pillars that hold up this bridge, and count two lines down from the top of any of those pillars, well, that was actually the height the river came to during the record-breaking floods of the year 2000. As I'm sure you can tell, much too high for us to have any boat trips that day. To be honest, I think you've been hard-pressed to get under here in a canoe without a heart helmet, at the very least. As we pass under this bridge, the area of land on our right-hand side is known as Clifton Inns. Inns are basically areas of wetland or washland that are used as part of flood defences for the city. In either end of these inns are sluice gates, and as the water starts to rise in the river, they'll open the sluice gates in the far end of these inns. They allow that whole area to flood. 
or Rocky Mountain Water Two, and waiting for the river to go down. As it does, the hope the sluice gets to the other end, allow the water to slowly flow back into the river, and it hopefully takes the top of some of the higher floods in the city centre. So as I mentioned, once I pass through this bridge here, I'm going to attempt that first turn. Although before I do it, it's worth noting that boats do not have indicators in the same way that cars do. In fact, we use sound signals to show our intentions. So if you hear one short blast on the horn, that will indicate I'm moving to the right, or to starboard, in naval terms. Of course, two short blasts indicate I'm moving to the left, or to port. And should you hear three blasts on the horn, that will suggest I'm activating stern propulsion, which essentially means I'm slowing down or stopping. But I would like to warn you, ladies and gentlemen, the one sound signal you should really listen out for is one prolonged blast that doesn't stop. Because that means I fall asleep in the head of the button. And that happens at the end of the Although I will say that that hasn't happened yet. But then I'm told there's a first time for everything. So do keep an army, folks. Well, just up here on the left is where I'm going to attempt this first turn, so please wish me luck, ladies and gentlemen. I've never actually turned the boat here before. I'll be honest with you, I've never driven a boat before either, so uh, this will be interesting. <laughs> then again, it looks easy enough. How hard can it be, right? Well, I guess we're going to find out together. Because here we go, death defying maneuver number one coming up. Brace yourselves, folks. No, I I say, Morgan. Sounds beautiful, isn't it? Well, I was quite impressed with that turn. You lot clearly weren't. Oh well. Oh, thank you. I'll take a sarcastic clap. I'm not proud. Now, I do tend to talk quite a lot during these hour cruises. So for the next minute or so, I'm going to put the microphone down. But I'll let you know the next sight we'll see will be York Minster from the river. So if you fancy the picture, it's probably worth getting your cameras ready now. As I say though, that'll be in a minute or so, until then I'll put the microphone down, but whether you consider it a threat or a promise, I will be back with you very shortly. Someone fishing there, look. Smell coconut. Smell coconuts. That's all right, isn't it? A little tall and up. See them trees, they were like the ones we had in the garden. Similar to those. I think it's a popular tree now. Yeah? Got a popular tree. It's 
So as you start to look through the trees ahead on our left now, you begin to get your first views of the spires of the Metro Political Cathedral Church of St. Peter the Apostle in York, which is a very grand name for a very grand building, but it's also a bit of a mouthful, which is probably why most locals just refer to it as York Minster. Although I have had it called on more than one occasion now, that there big church. So I suppose any name is equally appropriate. Once it comes back out from behind this tree, what we'll see from here is the west end of the nave. You have the two western bell towers in the forefront, and of course the Grand Central Tower is just behind. Well, the Minster stands at a height of 235.6 feet above the city, and that makes it the tallest point in York. That's due to a local bylaw that states nothing in York shall ever be built taller than the spires of York Minster. So we don't expect any skyscrapers anytime soon. Well, for those of you that feel up for a challenge, you can actually climb to the very top of the Minster. Yeah, we've done that, you, so It's quite a challenge. It's up 276 steep and winding steps. And getting fit on the way is not an option. I know this because over the last 10 years, six people have had to be airlifted from the very top of the Minster, obviously undertaking that challenge without full consideration. So it is worth a thought before you attempt it. Now, of course, if you manage to make it to the very top, then you'd be rewarded with the best views in the city. On a very clear day, unlike today, you can see for nearly 30 miles in every direction across the entire Vale of York. So it is well worth the effort. Now the Minster stands here today is actually the fourth to stand on the spot with the others being destroyed or replaced in the many sieges and occupations of the city. The construction of this one began in 1227 AD, although it wasn't finally declared complete until 1472. It took skilled craftsmen nearly 250 years to build. Sounds like the same people that are building my extension. Though despite the length of time, it is still an impressive feat, especially when you consider it is the largest Gothic cathedral in Northern Europe inside the total volume, as well as housing the large collection of medieval stained glass in the country, with around two-thirds of all the remaining medieval stained glass being in the Minster. Well, that is spread over 128 medieval stained glass windows, large to limit the Grand East window, which measures more than the centre court at Wimbledon. Although the onset of World War II, someone had the unenviable task of removing each and every piece of that medieval stained glass before cataloguing it and then storing it away for war. Despite working around the clock, it still took the team nearly six months to complete the job. Of course, then at the end of the war, they had to put it all back in again. A two million piece medieval stained glass jigsaw. But by then, they seemed to know what they were doing, as to replace the glass only well, took around two months. Now the Minster is our main attraction here in the city, and as a result there's a small charge for entering or going to the top, but it's well worth it. Although if you don't fancy walking around the Minster, you can get some very nice views from the city walls. We all have some of the most extensive city walls in the country, and in my personal opinion, some of the best views of the Minster and its surrounding gardens can be seen from there. Of course, it is free to walk around those walls. It takes no more than an hour or two at the very most, but it is a lovely way to see York from a slightly different perspective. So I'm sure you can already tell the best views of the Minster now disappear again behind these trees. So at this point I'll go back to talking about the river. And as mentioned, York is prone to flooding. At least a couple of times each year the river will breach its banks and flood the city, so we do have a variety of flood defences. Some more of which can be seen over there on our left once again. That large grassy bank. As we follow that back around this corner, you'll see it does eventually meet up with a red brick wall with black gates laid into them at the top of the gardens on our left hand side. And these were flood defences laid down in the 1980s as a reaction to the higher floods of the time. Both that grassy bank and the wall it meets with were originally built to a height of 18 feet above the normal river levels. And that was just about the right height, especially during those record-breaking floods in the year 2000, when the water climbed to 17 foot and 10 inches, just two inches from oozing over the top of those defences. Actually, at the time, the government believed the walls would be breached, even had Chinook helicopters flying sandbags into the city to place on top of those defences to protect the buildings. Now it doesn't just protect the buildings along the river bank, there's around 700 homes behind, as well as shops, schools, and of course York Hospital. So the flood height around 13 feet above normal, council come around day or night, rain or shine, to close off the black gates in the top of the gardens. Then as the water subsides, they'll come back around and open them up again. 
Well, of course, we do hope these defences continue to deck the buildings in the future. And we all are told by the Environment Agency that a flood height in Europe of 17 foot or more is once in just a 1,000 year occurrence. That probably explains why it's actually happened four times in the last 10 years. The chances are we may need to build these defences even higher in the future, though like many things here in the city, it's just a case of waiting to see what happens next. Look just on our left there, you'll get a nice view of a kingfisher just flying along the bank there. They were a rare sight, but uh, you can just see a flash of blue. There he goes. Ah, uh, wow. So we're going to head back through Scarborough Bridge now on our way back towards the medieval city. Unbelievable. Before we do, if you look through the left hand arch of the bridge, you'll see there's a ruined stone tower. It's not part of the city walls, but it is made from the same material. It's actually what remains of the Marygate Tower. It was much taller when it was first built. It was originally erected in 1266, but during the Civil War in 1644, nah. Cromwell and his round head forces seized the city, destroying many of the medieval buildings. The Marygate yeah, Tower there was reduced to around half its size. <laughs> it's a bit of a kingfisher, isn't it? Before that time, though, it marked the western corner point of St. Mary's Abbey, a very powerful 13th century Benedictine Abbey that once stood within New Zealand Gardens. Although, much like that tower, only the ruins of the Abbey remain today. But the Abbey itself was actually a product of the dissolution of the monasteries under King Henry VIII's rule, which you might have learned about in school. This was an attempt by King Henry VIII to take back the power from the church so he could upgrade his first one. The one building that does still remain from those times was visible once we pass through the bridge here. Once you make it through the bridge, you look back towards the tower, just above it, through the trees, you should be able to make out a white and black wooden building with a red roof. And that was the Hospitium for the Abbey. Now, a Hospitium was much like a guest house. It's where pilgrims and travellers who visited the Abbey could stay and rest overnight before they continued their journey. And it's actually where we get the modern word hospitality from. Now, the Hospitium survived the dissolution of the monastery by being sold off by one of their abbots as a private dwelling. And nowadays, it actually acts as a panic to the Yorkshire Museum, as well as being very nice for the big venue. Of course, the other building to remain within Museum Gardens is the Tempest Anderson Hall, so that's better. better known today as the Yorkshire Museum. And as the name would suggest, it does have a variety of exhibits from both York and the surrounding area, but it also houses natural exhibits. Back just a few years ago, Sir David Attenborough was there to open up their famed dinosaur exhibit. And of the many museums in the city, this one's probably my favourite. And if you don't fancy walking around the museum, you could spend a lovely afternoon in Museum Gardens, an area of gardens, parklands and woodlands, which again is free to enter. So you can sit on the grass and enjoy picnics with the family, or if the weather brightens up, get yourself an ice cream and walk around looking at the history. Just up ahead, on our left there, just in front of that narrow beam, you'll see there's a gap in the trees so which you'll get a view of the gardens and if you look to the very top of the hill as we pass you'll also get a lovely view of the Yorkshire Museum while just the left of that through the trees you might be able to catch a quick glimpse of the ruins of St Mary's Abbey as I say that will all come into view on our left hand side in just a moment well, there it is just going to give you a hit on our left So once we pass this gap in the trees and everyone manages to have a good look, if you then draw your attention ahead of us, you'll see the first of two cast iron road bridges we're going to pass under. This one is Lendl Bridge, it was designed and built by Sir Thomas Page, who was actually studying to be a sailor of all things. Though why on earth he wants to do that, I have no idea. But luckily for him, somebody suggested he tries hand at engineering. He certainly found his calling. In fact, Mr Page is the man responsible for the design and build of Westminster Bridge in London. Now, as before designing this bridge, as well as another that will pass under towards the end of the cruise, you probably notice some similarities with the two cast iron road bridges here in York and Westminster Bridge in the capital. Through the bridge on the left hand side there, you can see the city cruise's boatyard. Well, there has been a boatyard here since 1846, although many of the surrounding buildings, and to be honest, some of our current captains, predate that by well over 100 years. One such building you can see is York's Guildhall, and on the left there, parts of that date back to the 15th century, making it older than the Guildhall in London. Although much of what we see today is actually post-war restoration, because during the Second World War, York was attacked by the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force. They dropped around 100 incendiary bombs on the city. Six of them hit the Guildhall, destroying the roof entirely and much of the inside. 
As we sail past, if you look at the ground floor windows of the guild hall, round those windows, you'll notice there's some smoke damage the fires were raised. And as we sail past, if you look at the bottom of the smoke damage, you can see it's been washed away in a straight line. Washed away by the river during the record breaking floods in the year 2000. The water sat there for little over a week, and due to a reaction with the Yorkstone, the building's made up, it washed away part of history. Although it is a good indication of just how high the river really can come. So we're going to move ahead to our right hand side now where we have the Park Inn Hotel, York's second tallest building, second only to the Minster, only not so grand. It was opened in the 1960s, originally named the Viking Hotel, because Viking artifacts were found when digging up the bank. Not a huge surprise though, because that bridge ahead of us was roughly the site of the original Norse River crossing, the Dublin Stones, which was part of the Vikings trade route through Scandinavia in the United Kingdom on the way out to Ireland. Although an interesting fact about this building is when it first opened, it actually won an architectural award for its good looks. It's one of York's many mysteries. I can only assume there was a very short, short list that year. So moving to that bridge ahead of us now, that is the Hughes Bridge, named the Hughes Bridge because for nearly a millennium, for nearly a thousand years, it was the only crossing over the river, hence the name. Although the bridge that stands there today is actually the fifth to stand on the spot. There's been a variety of bridges in all shapes and sizes over the years. The grandest of them was the one that came before this. That fourth bridge stood nearly twice as tall as this one, and although it was only half as wide, on the bridge stood shops as well as houses. There was also a chapel and a prison. Though perhaps its biggest claim to fame, it was also the site of England's first ever public toilet. As I'm sure you can imagine, that was a hole cut into the bridge with a wooden shack built around it. So I very much doubt he wants more boat trips back in those days. And when he built this version of the bridge, in order to not cut the entire county of Yorkshire in half, half alongside the old bridge, before they knocked that one down and built the other half of this. And as we pass on the in a moment, if you look up onto the sides, well, you can still see the scene where those two parts of the bridge fit together. So once again, as we pass through this bridge, if you draw your attention over to the left, you'll see the King's Arms Pub. It's known locally as the Pub that floods, and it is one of the first buildings in the city to be affected by the rising river. Well, the landlord is a good Yorkshireman, and doesn't like to lose his product to the river, so instead of the traditional beer cellar, I actually convert your bedroom upstairs, it took the attic. Of course, that meant he was more than happy yeah. to keep the pub open during the floods. He would happily serve your pint while he was standing in a foot of water. And actually, on a few occasions, when this bar was overtaken by the river, he would even open the doors and windows and just hold canoe parties in the main saloon. Which, believe it or not, is actually not true. There used to be a lot of things on the river, so it's kind of not the boats. So we're passing through the old port district of York now, with Queen's Dave on our right and King's Dave on our left. Right. I mean, after all, I am told that a good captain will receive good tips. And believe it or not, I do occasionally receive a good tip. Now, admittedly, it's normally a tip like, if you don't slow down, you're going to hit that bridge. Why not talk less? Or perhaps try to make a good joke of doing the commentary. I'm not entirely sure they're the kind of tips that others are talking about. But to be honest, I'll take what I can get in this life. You never know. Yeah. I might even listen to the advice one day. Although well, I can't guarantee the joke to be any better. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to fall alongside the landing, so I should probably put my phone down to make sure they're fresh. Thank you again for joining us. I do hope you enjoyed the rest of the afternoon or even here in York. That's all for me. So thank you very much. Have a good one. got big engines in that. I bet the big V8s. Wow, some money there, Dal. It's got a... Uh, it's got a very nice look to it. Look at this. This is our... This is our stopover. This place. Look at this. Mm. 
live in the dream. Oh, there is a cat. There's a cat. I can't believe it. Oh, look at this. It is just amazing. As if we're staying in here. Wow. And we've got a friend. Hello, matey. Love cats. What was that a thing for cats? Have a look at this. Have a look at this. Oh yeah, this is nice. There's even oils. Look at that. Very posh. <laughs> Very nice. And the balls. What have you got? You can get a blanket. Wow. And a hairdryer. Let's get wasted.